We're going to go ahead and call to order uh, the Capitola City Council meeting for Thursday, April 25th. Do we have any public comment on our closed session items? Seeing none, we'll recess to closed session and return at 6 p.m. Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started and call to order our Thursday, April 25th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Uh, we'll start with a roll call, please. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Books? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Thank you. Uh, we all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Staff has no changes to the agenda. All right. Uh, we will move on to presentations, and we will start with present presentations of certificates of recognition to Capitola Local Government Academy participants. Um, so I will go ahead and name those who were involved in the Local Government Academy this year. Uh, you're welcome to come up. Our city clerk has some certificates for you. Um, so I will start uh, with John Mulry. Doesn't look like he's here. We'll go to Matt Arthur. We also have Sue Campbell. Celine Grenier. Did I say it right? All right. And Kevin Keat. All right. Thank you all so much for your participation. Um, for those who are not aware, the Local Government Academy gives citizens an opportunity to learn about how our government works. Over the course of four weeks, participants learn about Capitola's history, the city's organizational structure, how external agencies support the city, and they hear from city staff to understand the ins and outs of what each department does. Uh, participants will leave this program prepared to get involved uh, in the city, and that could be through volunteer work, through city advisory bodies, or even elected uh, positions as a city council member. So we, again, thank and congratulate our participants for completing the 2024 Local Government Academy. Thank you. Do we, um, do you want to do a picture with council for those who are here? Go to what? Okay. All right. Uh, we will move on now to uh, our second presentation, Introduction of Finance Department Account Clerk Catherine Haney. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My pleasure tonight to introduce Catherine Haney as our new account clerk in the Finance Department. Catherine graduated from CSU Chico in May of 2023 with a uh, bachelor's degree in business admin and specialty in finance. Um, Catherine, who's from Santa Cruz, returned to the area um, following graduation and worked for the Bank of Montreal as an associate banker in downtown Santa Cruz, not actually Montreal. <laughs> uh, 
um, um, before coming over to the city, and she came over here uh, March 25th and has fit in seamlessly. And one little side note was she had a prearranged um, trip to go to Texas and see the eclipse firsthand. So that was pretty cool, I thought. So please join me in welcoming Catherine. We're excited to have her. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, super grateful for the opportunity. Definitely excited to learn more and to work so closely to the beach, which is definitely a plus. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We're excited to have you. Welcome. All right, we'll move on to item four, report on closed session. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss items one and two on this evening's closed session agenda. Uh, no reportable action was taken, and the City Council will reconvene in closed session um, after, after open session to discuss item number three. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, any additional materials. Staff did receive two emails related to item 9A. Both were shared with the City Council and published online and in our hard copy agenda packet, and all presentations for tonight were also shared um, prior to tonight's meeting. Thank you. We'll go to item six, which is oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Any oral communications this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to staff and city council comments, and we'll start with staff. Some staff comments this evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I've got some exciting news. Next Tuesday night, on uh, Tuesday, April 30th, we're going to host a second town meeting, town hall meeting, and it's going to be focused on the wharf. We'll be providing an update to the public on the wharf. We'll also be providing an update on the survey results. We had over a thousand participants. And then from there, we'll be taking additional public comment. We'll have a, um, a little interactive exercise as well as open and opening the mic for comments. So um, we're looking forward to that. It's going to start at 530 and hopefully we'll have a good turnout. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, council comments. Do you have any council comments on this end? Yeah, Council Member Clark. Yeah, exciting. I was at Richmond Mansion Park today, and they started. They actually finally started. Um, you know, it's gonna, they said it's going to be at least a year before they get the, all the paths and everything open. You know, people out there working, but it's awfully exciting to see them out there actually working on it. Yes, go ahead, Vice Mayor Brooke. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to report to staff that um, I've noticed that there's been an, uh, not so many people signing up on the Finance Advisory Committee, and it would be great to see if we can open that up. I think right now it's just primarily for the spots are open for business, um, but if we can open that up to the community so we can get more applicants, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, that will require a change to the fact bylaws, but we can we can definitely prioritize that for the coming meeting. Councilman Peterson, do you have one? No. All right. All right. Great. We will move on to item eight, which is our consent items, which will be enacted by one motion in the form listed on the agenda. Uh, any council members have any questions or want to pull an item on consent? All right. Hearing none, we will entertain a motion. I can move the consent. I can second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item nine, our general government and public hearings, starting with 9A, our city hall needs assessment. Okay. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. So tonight we'll be presenting the, um, the City Hall Needs Assessment, and on the call we've got Andrea Gifford of Group 4 Architecture, who led the effort with the city. So next slide, please. Um, so first I'm going to give an update on the project schedule, and then Andrea will take it the next step into the existing conditions analysis and take it from there. So our project schedule, we began this effort um, towards the beginning of the year, or at la the end of last year, and the first steps were to do the existing conditions analysis, really look at the existing city hall site, um, 
and our previous building official did a lot of the work on documenting the City Hall site and some of the challenges we face within City Hall. And then uh, Group 4 Architecture took over to talk about space needs, looking at projections for the future, and then um, put together our summary and findings, which you see in the published report, which is draft now. If we get feedback tonight on any edits you'd like in that draft report, we can make those changes. Um, and that that's the process we went through. Um, Andrea is going to go into much more detail, and Andrea, you can take it from here. And Andrea's got a cold this evening, so she's not in person. She's planning on being here, but um, she's doing us all a favor by keeping us healthy. So thank you. We hope you feel better. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be with you and presenting the project to you, the mayor and council. Again, apologies for not being able to be there in person, but um, Tis the season when you have children. So I will kick off with the existing conditions analysis that where we were really supported by city staff. We'll then go into projections and end on next steps. Next slide. So the area that was uh, part of the proposed scope of work for the City Hall space planning included the entire Capitola City Hall site, uh, all seven acres. Uh, we predominantly focused our efforts on uh, the, the built facilities on the western side of the site. So if you adjust, next slide. And those uh, facilities uh, included the police storage, uh, the city hall, which is a two-story space, uh, the police department, the northern wing, as well as the Capitola Museum. Next slide. Uh, your current city hall dates back to 1976, so you're just getting ready to celebrate its 50th anniversary here. Uh, it's currently roughly around 12,300, and that does include the police storage uh, facility that was uh, newly built uh, to the north of the site. It serves a population of almost 10,000 uh, residents and a house is approximately 52 and a half uh, FTE staff. The first step was to identify some of the current building issues um, in addition to a number of the building systems being uh, at the end of their life or having inadequacies uh, with HVAC, uh, roofing. Uh, the facility is located within the floodplain, um, but there are a number of issues uh, within the building that also uh, provide some uh, service issues to staff, which include the public service counter and lobby size, uh, just being not adequate in its size or very welcoming for community members. The staff break room is uncomfortable and also small, uh, given the number of occupants it serves. And overall, the space uh, really lacks uh, in square footage as well as some modernization. Next slide. When we think about the police station, again, the facility, given that it's serving uh, Focus on emergency responders is still located within a floodplain, which is highly unusual uh, with that type of facility. It lacks dedicated meeting rooms that are actually separate from staff workspace. So there's actually no dedicated meeting rooms for the police staff to conduct uh, meetings within. Again, the public service counter is quite small, uh, not uh, welcoming to residents. There is no staff break room for the police station. They share uh, a break room with city hall staff and the locker rooms are uh, inadequate uh, and not meeting current requirements. There are a number of areas that could be improved to help staff efficiency. Uh, the location of the layouts and staff within the facility could be improved. Right now, uh, the public service counter is on the second floor, um, shared by multiple staff, uh, and those staff are sometimes not directly adjacent to that. Uh, there's a lack of collaboration space and conference space to adequately adequately serve all the departments within City Hall. Um, the police storage is in a separate facility, so that requires some inefficiency in how they uh, work. Uh, the public, uh, the police cars are actually located in a public lot, and typically they would be in a more secure lot, uh, separate from uh, public vehicles. And the office for the museum curator uh, is located within City Hall uh, that's serving uh, the local history museum. We also, uh, thank you, uh, looked at how space was being utilized on City Hall. And so the top 
bar chart represents the current space utilized um, within that facility. Uh, these bar charts do exclude the community room and council chambers on the first floor. So we're predominantly looking at uh, the city hall office space. 35% uh, of the building is dedicated to your lobby and circulation, 14% uh, for storage and building support, 9% for meeting rooms and amenities, and 42% for office space. Uh, the bar chart in the bottom is what a typical uh, city hall office space utilized would, utilization would look like. Uh, usually your lobby or circulation is closer to 20 to 25 percent, uh, including the lobby space there. Uh, building and storage support uh, should be closer to 10 percent. Meeting rooms and amenities should be increased to 15 percent. And generally the office space takes up uh, about half of the space uh, in, a, in a more efficiently designed facility. We also did uh, conducted a staff survey. Uh, we had 40 responses of the 52 uh, staff, which was fantastic. Uh, and the slide above, or as shown here, and just indicates some of the uh, responses that we received. The majority of your staff are on video conference calls uh, a couple hours a day. The majority of your staff interact with the public at the service counter, uh, and half of that interaction is on a daily basis. Uh, and most of the city staff in, uh, share their workspaces. We also ask staff to describe a number of different areas within City Hall, uh, and this is the ranking of them that uh, those conditions of these areas that are considered great. Um, so the highest ranking area uh, within City Hall is actually your parking lot at 21%, and then it, you can see it drops off quickly after that. Uh, we adjust, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we can see some of the conditions of the spaces that were considered good or sufficient. So again, uh, coupled with the great, your parking lot uh, is about 50% of your staff feel in good or sufficient. Uh, technology is really good. Uh, and then uh, dropping down to meeting space and adjacencies. And then the, the last slide uh, lists the conditions of areas that staff felt were insufficient or just okay. Um, and so here you can see the, the inverse of what we've been seeing, the break room, as we mentioned, highly uh, in, unacceptable, uh, not really working for staff. They're, the general circulation throughout the space, as we noted, it's highly inefficient and that circulation uh, isn't really working well. Uh, storage, restrooms, and again, that public service counter, um, again, one of those uh, areas so, that staff feel are really inefficient. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Okay. We're having some technical issues on, on our end, so we've lost the slides. Okay. If you could give us just a quick second. Of course. Can you not see me, hear me, or is it anything to do with me? We can, uh, it's not on your end, it's on our end. Okay. <laughs> it's Great. It's a, <laughs> we can see you now. Did we talk about uh, tech needs in this assessment? I feel like we should have if we didn't. Yeah. Well, 69% of the year staff feel slides. tech technology and, is not so great. So. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea, can you share uh, your okay. slides? Can you share them from your end by any chance? I can indeed. I do have it up on my screen if you would like me to. Um, uh, I think you would just, uh, yes, stop other people's. Yeah, I think Let we need to stop our screen sharing first. Let me just put it. Okay. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Okay, I think you should be able to, sh to share now. Okay. The, the goal, Andrea, is, is to get full screen. We were, we that go. is much better. Thank okay. you. Fantastic. Thank help. you so much. All right. <laughs> go ahead and continue. Sorry for the interruption. That's okay. I was looking at it on my screen in a very large format, so I'm glad everyone else can see it. Um, so again, here, here we are on the slide about uh, the conditions of areas that were just insufficient or okay. Um, we also asked uh, staff to describe their current workspace. Uh, the number one response was that it was outdated. It did have significant maintenance needs, noisy, crowded, unpleasant. So just some of the things that we've, uh, we're trying to capture just to get a sense of how City Hall was currently working. Um, from there, uh, now that we established sort of the existing conditions, we went on to talk about uh, what the projections of what a new City Hall or a functioning City Hall would would look like. Uh, the first thing that we did was look at different industry planning standards for office space. Um, as we all know, started probably start at the 20th 
21st century, uh, the amount of space dedicated to staff was higher. It was closer to above 200, all the way up to 300 square foot per person. Uh, and that was really relying on a couple of things. One, the demand of kind of physical paper still and the size of technology as the demand of paper and digital uh, work environments and more mobile technology and smaller technology has evolved. Uh, we've seen a decrease in the square foot of per person dedicated to office space. And now the average density is as 150 down to 175 square foot per person. Um, and it's predicted that with remote work capability that came out of the pandemic that that will either hold or continue to decrease. Um, what's that to say is uh, when we are thinking about how much square foot per person a city hall should look at, we set a standard or set a bar at 150 square foot per staff. Um, when we thought about the police, uh, based on the ability of them working in shifts, the idea that they do share a fair amount of desks, they work in, in shared shifts and so they share desks. They also have a high amount of field work, obviously, uh, and very few private offices that they could uh, use a slightly denser uh, square foot per person. Uh, at, and we were targeting 100 uh, square foot per person uh, with those areas. Uh, how does that compare to how staff square footage is currently? So currently City Hall staff are averaging 111 square foot per staff, so a very high dense uh, density of use. Um, and again, our target was to, to get something closer to 150. And then when we think about police staff, uh, they're down to 64 square foot per staff. Uh, and this is actually probably something you'd probably see in a call center, you know, someone that has very small, tightly packed uh, desk. Uh, and so again, well below that uh, industry average or standard of 100 square foot uh, per staff. We also try to look at some best practices that are happening in current workspaces, things like more collaborative workspaces, the ability for departments to work together and spaces for that to happen, uh, providing adequate locker rooms, lobby spaces and break rooms, uh, those key amenities that really promote a healthy work environment, um, providing uh, workstations that do have a smaller footprint and accommodate some mobility in the workplace, but also have a fair amount of community space um, and shared spaces that they can utilize uh, when not at their workspace. Some of the other projections that we looked at, we also looked at historically how staff have evolved. Um, and so you can see on the far left, our benchmark was back at uh, the beginning of the 21st century here at 2000, where staff were at 52.8 FTE. Uh, staff did decrease during the recession and have slowly been climbing back and have actually now, you know, returned back to their pre-recession staffing areas. We also were looking at population. Um, population has been trending fairly flat uh, over the last couple decades, uh, but there are some significant projections uh, within the population growth. And we looked at four different models uh, or four different ways to think about uh, the population growth in Capitola. Uh, starting at the far left, uh, the AMBAG Metro Transportation Report of 2040 indicated a potential growth of 11%. Uh, the trending growth uh, that your staff does uh, without the mall development, uh, targeting about 16%. If the wall, mall development would happen, that growth would increase to 23%. Uh, and then the AMBAG housing element uh, report predicts potentially all the way up as much as a 36% growth. So you can see quite a range, um, but the one indication is that there's all some potential growth happening uh, in the near future for Capitola. We also were looking at your revenue and general fund. Um, that this has been slowly climbing uh, over the last 10 years. Um, but one thing to note is that it's not quite in line with the adjusted inflation. So while it has been increasing, it's not keeping up with an inflation. And so after we've kind of thought about all the different projections, we came up with some draft space needs. The table reads at the top of the, the first row is showing your existing conditions uh, of square footage at 7,800 <coughs> 7, square feet dedicated for just City Hall, including the community space and council chambers. If 
if we were to take uh, that same amount of staff and to dedicate uh, what we call right size the, the facility and to provide, as we indicated, that 150 square foot per staff, uh, that would bring uh, your city hall needs to be uh, about 1,000 square feet more, 8,800 square feet. And as you think about if you're uh, planning for a new facility or renovation, we all obviously should always talk about some growth in there. Uh, it would be... Uh, you know, not forward thinking to sort of plan to today's staffing, but to allow a, a small amount of growth. And we had targeted a 10, 15 or 20% growth, providing uh, a range of square footage needs for City Hall from 9,500 to 10,300. We did the same exercise uh, for your police. Again, uh, your existing uh, staffing, 44,560 dedicated to police. If we were to right size that facility, uh, to the 100 square foot per staff, that would increase to 6,400 square feet. And then planning for some amount of growth, 10, 15, or 20% growth would bring that somewhere between 7,000 and 7,600 square feet. And as a combined facility, uh, that's just totaled up. Uh, and again, as we're targeting a growth, somewhere between a 16,500 to 17,900 square foot facility. And so the last uh, topic we're going to go through is just kind of some next steps. Um, so as, as we stated, some key points about the building conditions. First and foremost, these facilities are in a floodplain. The images on the right show the uh, potential impacts that that has on this facility, especially as we're thinking uh, of this as a police station and how that uh, can hinder uh, the role that the police uh, res public safety res responders uh, within the city. Uh, the staff. Uh, survey results show uh, that there's some serious needs that should be addressed, including uh, the poor building condi conditions and adequate space to assist uh, the public with their daily requests. Uh, and really based on uh, that existing conditions report in the age of facility, uh, the building is really nearing its end of life. And so plans should be made for either uh, an extensive full building renovation or uh, new construction. When we think about key points from our space standards, again, providing uh, we should really feature a modern uh, community space, uh, a city council chambers that really meets the community needs. Really want to strive to enhance the customer experience for both the community as they enter city hall and police. So recommending a, a proper lobby area uh, that can serve both staff and community needs. Uh, we're not currently meeting kind of acceptable industry standards for the amount of square footage we're dedicating to staff. So trying to address those key issues. And again, providing the right balance of meeting rooms and amenities for city and police staff that are currently lacking. And the last is the projection. So again, our, our FDE has shown that staffing levels have returned to pre-recession levels and currently at capacity. Uh, there's projections that population will continue to grow uh, based on the four different development models, uh, and that directly impacts the amount of staff uh, needed uh, to serve the community, and that the best practices would be to plan for some amount of future growth uh, to accommodate either changes in staff, uh, the way that the community delivers services or the operations within staff can all impact uh, the space needs. And that would result in a combined city hall place uh, for station that would range uh, between that 16,500 or 17,900 square foot. So next steps, um, I think uh, uh, once after the adoption of this report, we really recommend that the city really identify and work with the community to talk about what the goals and the vision would be for a new city hall and police station uh, to then sort of create scenarios to not only address the needs, the growth and the visions and the community's identif uh, visions and goals identified through that community engagement. Um, the two different scenarios we're proposing is either renovation with an addition of the existing city hall and police or a new city hall and police station either on the existing site or another city owned uh, site. Uh, once those scenarios are identified, a budget could be established for each of those scenarios. And then we could come back and engage the community to gather information on those scenarios and then identify a preferred scenario and next steps for the proposed city hall and police station. With that, I um, want to thank you and uh, 
are open for any questions that the council might have. Thank you so much. Uh, council questions, start at this end. Councilmember Peterson. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I was curious about the um, expected need for increase in square footage compared to the um, expected increase of population. I'm guessing that is not a linear formula, but um, I'm just seeing 11 to 36 percent expected growth of the population in the next 20 years. But wouldn't the if we built a new building or did a major renovation of this building, wouldn't that be expected to be like more like 40, 60 years lasting? So why are we only looking at the population growth for 20 years? Andrew, can so, you hear That's okay. Um, so I my understanding is that these reports only project out 20 years, so uh, we're limited by uh, the information that is provided in the reports. So. So if we are expecting, like, maybe it doesn't make sense or maybe it does make sense, but I'm assuming that it would be, you know, some continued growth. Maybe that would change a lot, and it's a pretty wide range to begin with. But would the um, the range that was presented um, in this slide of between 10 and 20 percent square footage increase, would that make sense if we're talking about, you know, what we need for the next 60 years? I'm not sure what is the lifespan of it. Of building like this because this one is 50 years right and we're saying it's near the end of life is that expected if we rebuild generally public facilities are built to to last 50 years um so that's a pretty pretty typical uh change um there's a lot of factors that you could look into i'm not sure if um Population growth is a one-to-one -one for staff growth. So as percentage of population growth, it's not an exact one-to-one -one, uh, indicator of how to project staff. Um, but we could definitely revisit those projections in, a f in the future phase if desired. And I think it's also important to note that in that table where you're seeing 10 and 20% growth, that was um, 10 and 20, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrea, but 10 and 20% of growth tied to existing conditions of just percentages of the building space for right sized and then a 10% increase. So it wasn't in alignment with our projections for population growth. It's really about city hall size and there's a correlation of why we're projecting 10 and 20, but not it's not a direct one to one with population growth. Go ahead. And then I was going to add one more point is that I've seen jurisdictions deal with this kind of thing with basically sort of building like phase one and having a plan phase two. Like, you know, you just design the building in such a way. I see Andrea shaking her head. You may have experience doing this so that you know that there is a way to easily expand the building down the road should you need okay. to. Yeah, I guess my main point is I would want to make sure that, you know, if we're building it 15, 20 percent more square footage than we are, that it's going to be big enough to last expected growth for the next. 50 years of the lifespan of the building. Yes, and in the interim, you have the ability to lease that space to another right. um, office space. So That's a good point. Yep. Um, yes, there's then, oh. definitely been examples of both of that, either building for uh, enhanced growth, knowing that the city could lease out or use that uh, for other uses, or uh, as Jamie said, plan for multiple phases of growth and build as need. And I just had um, one more kind of question is, and this is for Jamie, uh, do we have any work from home policy currently? Do any staff members work partially or fully remote? So we don't have a formal work from home policy right now. You know, one of the challenges we face given our scale is that we don't have a lot of backup for each position, whereas if this, you know, is it, a hundred people in the finance department, you know, you know, you have multiple backup for multiple assignments. So we haven't, we don't have a formal work from home policy. It is something that we're looking at internally. Um, it may not be able to affect that many employees, but it could make a little bit of a difference. Yeah. And do you know if like our counterparts across the county or beyond, is that, is that common these days? I know it is with much of the workforce, but. It is relatively common, yes. So it is something that could potentially maybe should potentially be taken into account when the size of our needs going into the future. 
Yeah, I think Andrea can talk a little bit about that, about sort of how they factor work from home in and the overall kind of long-term projections. Yes, uh, I think as Jamie said, as you saw from the survey, about 80% of your staff are serving the public on a daily basis at the counter. Um, so there's not a lot of staff redundancy. So um, that's one thing that we would have to consider. Uh, the other one is if you do implement a work from home policy, um, unless you're providing what they call like an AB schedule. So two people are sharing a desk and those two people are <laughs> obviously not there ever at the same time. Uh, that's where you really see uh, a significant amount of square footage uh, being able to kind of get recaptured and reused. Um, if you don't have, an, uh, the, the backside of that is an obviously collaboration within a very small department decreases significantly when half a department is, uh, is always gone uh, or without of the office. Um, if you're only talking about remote work days, one or two days a week, then there's still uh, the need to provide every staff person their own individual workstation because their schedules could overlap. Um, and so that's that's sort of the balance that we need to take in, into effect is uh, even in a remote work policy, there may not be the capability of a true sharing of desk. Thank you. That's all. Thank you for your presentation. I just have a couple of questions. Um, in regards to the current amount of staff and the projections for growth, do we have a number of the increased staff will require for that population growth? Because the projections here say that we need X amount of square footage per employee. Um, I'm wondering if that was was um, talked about. So we do not have the specific number, but we would do the math backwards. So of like what the square footage per staff is. So if we're talking about a thousand square feet, additional space, um, I'm trying to find my chart. It's uh, really tied to like for police, we would divide that by 100 and for city hall, divided by 150. So I apologize for not having that exact number, but we would work the math backwards on that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I was just making a point. So when we talk about next steps or looking into particular next phases of um, with growth comes the requirement for more staff. And so the 10,000 square feet with 20% growth that we might need might even be more than that. Um, do I remember correctly that we had a preliminary study or plans created that was presented to staff already with City Hall renovations? And if that's true, or maybe I jumped it up. So I've been with the city for 10 years, and the first like town hall meeting I went to <laughs> was about um, a possible plan for City Hall. So that, that did occur 10 years ago, and I think... Ten years prior to that, there was another study done. So this has been, um, we've, this is the third time that we've been through this process. And as you saw in the um, growth projections, you know, back in 2000, we were at the staffing numbers that we are now. At 2010, when we went through the process of in a lot of public outreach tied to a possible plan for development at City Hall, uh, the staffing numbers were lower. And then... Um, and from that, I'll say when that study was done, some of the feedback we got is that these initial steps of documenting City Hall and what exists and going out to the public and hearing the vision of what they'd like in the future, um, there needs to be more emphasis on that. So this time we're really, we're documenting City Hall and then the next step would really be to go out to the public, to our residents, hear what the vision for the police station and city hall is for the future, and then come back with scenarios based on that. So a lot of public input up front. And then we're here today because we're back at kind of peak staffing and in the same structure. So, And, and my last question is, is just to the point that we don't own lots of land. Anyhow, this is kind of what we have currently. So when we look at next steps we're, um, or phase 2.0 or 3.0, whatever this is from 20 years ago, we're actually really talking about the space we have now. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. We're going to take it now to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to uh, comment on this item, now would be the time. 
Any public comment? All right. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett, Vision of the Public. Um, some thoughts on this. I wonder how much it's really necessary. And you are projecting population increase. However, I've been hearing on the news how populations are in decline all over the world. Some of the causal factors I've learned are like men have their cell phones here radiating their gonads. It's affecting the sperm count. And I have an article here also about, this is called, this relates COVID shots for adults and children, what we know now, Weston A. Price Foundation. Research found that two doses of Pfizer's COVID shots impaired semen concentration and motile counts in men for at least three months. Pfizer documents released by court order confirmed that in women whose pregnancy outcomes were known, 87.5% of pregnancies ended in a miscarriage during clinical trials. A widely circulated, this is the last point here, a CDC-sponsored study used to claim that the shots are safe during pregnancy misreported its pregnancy loss data. The actual miscarriage rate was 82%. So I'm questioning the population growth quite seriously. Also, you're talking about vision of the public. And I want to offer some uh, critical and vital alternatives and analysis. What I always look for in decades past, of course, we're going to a place where it wasn't, people weren't smoking. Probably in this chamber 40 years ago, people smoked, right, all the time. Now we have microwave radiation from all these um, wireless microwave emitting sources. And the documentation is overwhelming. I'll just read you a little bit. These should be replaced by wired, like Ethernet technology. And just because, how much time? I have a little bit. This is called public health warning. Wireless devices emit microwave radiation, a known biological hazard. Every time you use a wireless device, you're exposed to microwave radiation. The World Health Organization labels this radiation as a possible carcinogen. So that's my vision, is to see wired technology. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have my own clipboard. Same color. <laughs> it does look like the same one. Oh, run away with yours. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Any further public comment on this item? All right. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to City Council for a deliberation uh, and discussion. I don't think we have a vote on this this evening. It's just receiving the presentation, correct? Okay. So any further uh, discussion? I'll start at this end this time. Councilmember Clark? Yeah. Great presentation. A lot of good uh, numbers. Give us a good, a good clear um, view that we definitely need to do with City Hall and the Police Department. We've been talking about this for two to three decades now. Um, even, even before the flood of 2011, um, I think it's time for the City Council to make it a, a top priority. And uh, we do have some places where we can build just outside of the, the flood zone that the city owns. But and we really do need to take a good look at this. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Morgan? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm definitely in an agreement that I would like to sort of bring this back as a priority for the city. Um, I realize the budget is an issue, uh, but I want to show our staff members, our police department, that we're in support of them being happy while they're at work and not being ashamed to have somebody from another police department come and see <laughs> where, where their workspace is and what that looks like. Um, also, a huge point that I remember 
um, was just the safety aspect of where our police are able to park their vehicles. Um, it, not only being in a floodplain, but being in a public area, uh, I think we need to really think about that moving forward. It, I don't know what that looks like space-wise, but I think that is of importance. Um, and I, I like the idea that we had talked about either maybe utilizing another area and building something new that in turn we could either rent out at some point in when we're in transition or something like that. So I want to see what the options are um, for something like that to sort of, you know, make, make this a more robust situation for us. But thank you for the presentation. And yeah, I want to see what we can come up with. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, Katie, can you give us, um, I know that council made this a priority. That's why we have our report today. Um, what, what are the next steps? What are we looking at? Um, so the next steps would be I'll just take a step back. So back on March 6th, when we went through the budget principles and goals, um, going to the next steps did not rise under like uh, what would be done in the next fiscal year because of funding and then just department obligations at the time. So uh, definitely happy to bring it back to you. Um, but the next steps would be... Um, so just for clarity, we met our current council goal of completing this project. The um, first or the study excuse. phase one. Okay. Phase two, the next step is to go out and really look at the goals and vision of the community for the police station and city hall. Mm -hmm. Then coming up with scenarios to look at, both um, scenarios for doing an addition to city hall or um, creating a whole new city hall on the property. Um, Next, we would get numbers tied to those different scenarios and then go back out to the public with different scenarios at different costs and get more feedback on which alternative or non-alternative would be chosen. So, And so phase two, the, um, the budget that's tied to that was not allocated in the goals that we've set already. Do we have a number about the what phase two? The projection for phase two, um, when we set out on this, is $67,150. We know we don't have that much money in our budget for this year um, based off of what was brought to us what, last time, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, early March. Yeah. Um, so 67000 to move into phase two. And the, if we, so that's, what month is that? If we were to make that? Uh, next year's priority. When could we see the? Would that be next? Yeah, the next April. Would oh for you know what I mean? Plan out a year. Yes, uh -huh. so it would be next March, making that a priority within the budget goals. Okay, is that the question tonight to ask us if we want to do this now or later, based off the budget? And Jamie looks like he's. We could either do this tonight um, if you wanted to give direction, but it, we would definitely come back to you during the budget session to discuss if 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 guided in that direction. If you did not want us to bring it back during the budget discussions, I think the clear message tonight would be let's hold off. On. Yeah, I mean, I would look at my colleagues just because we know, even if we figured out the 67,000 to go to phase two, we know that we don't have the budget to rebuild. Once we know, we know what we need to do. We just don't have those dollars tied or we don't have that, those funds to move forward, which is always so hard to do. I would be looking for feedback whether, I, I mean, I could go either way. I don't know that it's a priority as, as of this moment. It's information that we were gathering, but it's up to all of us to see if we want to do. A question for Katie. Yeah. What could we do without spending the money right now to try to get to the next step, just so we're moving forward? I believe there's $70,000 in the current budget to do upgrades to the restrooms and the police facilities. So that, that is one thing that is happening um, within the current budget. Um, but other projects, I don't think we have any other projects identified. I think Councilmember Clark, you were asking about how to advance the ball in the long-term plan. Yeah. I mean, it's a trick. So I, Director Hurley, he's exactly right that during the goal setting session, we identified this as an important project, but it sort of fell below the line in terms of resources and stat and funding for this next fiscal year. You know, one of the thoughts I've had is, is that we can take another look at that. We're going to be producing the budget and talking about those goals coming up here next in a few weeks. 
frankly. Um, so you can take a look at the overall priorities for next fiscal year. We can see where this might slot in. Another option would be to sort of give staff the, the thumbs up and say, look, when we get some bandwidth and some resources, you guys would be interested in seeing a proposal for us to come back with phase two, but we can't move forward at this point. So those are a couple different options I've thought of. Uh, short of it, at this point, just sort of taking no action tonight is either just say, hey, let's talk about it further in the budget or say, hey, staff, when there's some bandwidth, and maybe some potential funding, let us know and, and we'll try to move it forward then. Yeah, I'd like to um, revisit this during our uh, budget discussions and see if we can't find that 67,000 somewhere, but I, I would be more um, concerned about staff time than the 67,000 compared um, to take this next step forward. And I would suggest that we um, see if we can't uh, find that during the budget, see if we can't get that together, and then uh, put it as like a, you know, secondary priority if staff has the time, because staff has a lot on their plate right now. And I don't, you know, we can ask them to do you know, everything, but they have a finite amount of time and splitting tasks they're splitting their time up to a million tasks is probably not very efficient. So, um, yeah, I would think it would be great if we could somehow put together the money to move forward to the second phase um, and give staff direction to do it as they are able to, if they are able to during this next fiscal year. I guess I have, can you clarify, like, what the, what's encompassed in that $67,000? Um, so, Definitely two public outreach meetings, one for the visioning and goal setting. Um, then it would come, and then it would, we'd create scenarios, so they would actually develop different scenarios. Um, I think in the RFP, we identified a number. I think it's like three or four scenarios for City Hall development. And then that would, you know, and throughout the process, we'd be coming back to City Council. But once those scenarios are developed going back out to the public to see which one is the best and then taking it to city council for a final decision. So if we've already been told that there's like three or four ideas, do we have that on paper or like in some type of... So they would develop the scenarios and actually show just like very simple renderings of what could happen on City Hall to like give the to put a picture to the to yeah. the project. So, okay. Uh, if I if I may, um, I would. So I, I see Council Member Peterson's point. I'm thinking about the gray lines in our budget. You know, the light gray and the yeah, light yeah. gray. That, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's fair. I'm actually not going to be at that budget meeting. I so I'm going to share okay. my thoughts here. Um, I don't. I don't see a, a point in allocating those dollars. Just thinking about the community outreach we're already doing for the wharf, and asking the community for input for this. It's just a lot for the, also the community to be thinking about. Lots of big projects. To your point, lots of staff time. Um, but I don't know that's a decision we need to make tonight, but I just want to share my feelings about allocating any dollars. I think it's fair to make it a priority um, and maintaining that and definitely getting back to phase two um, so we can see those renderings and what we can do and address your point, Councilmember Morgan, about, well, what if we have to rent something or, you know, getting all that data and information will be helpful and praying that there's not a flood in the meantime. Um, but as of today, I am comfortable with the information we received and um, maintaining it as a gray item because I think it's actually on the sheet in gray. Yeah. So, that, so that's just my feedback. Thank you. All right. I'll just share, uh, share some quick comments. So I do see the very real need that we have here for an, a, an improved facility for our staff and our uh, PD specifically with the amount of square footage that they're at now compared to what they need to be at. It was um, quite surprising. Uh, I agree, though, that we do have other budget priorities at this time. I don't mind it being brought back during the budget discussions for us to hear about it. I am um, wondering if there has been any discussion of just a ballpark figure of what we anticipate this kind of project would cost. So I am going to ask Andrea for help. I assume, Andrea, you're still on on this one. Assuming tens of millions. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that's a good guess. Andrea, I think, will be able to chime in with a little bit more information. I do think that given the disasters we've had and the actual flooding in our police department, that some of the emergency operations could be potentially funded from the outside. But at the core of it, city halls are usually funded by cities internally. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Andrea, for your, your input to that. Yeah. Um, so as we all know, construction prices have been ever escalating, uh, especially over the past couple of years. Um, the price per square foot for a city hall is roughly $1,000 a square foot would be a good starting budget. Uh, police stations are more. As you know, police stations have to be built to a higher level of standards when it comes to the seismic and building code requirements. So they're built to withstand uh, and be you know, available during those emergency uses. So they have an even higher uh, cost per square foot uh, upwards to uh, 1,200 square feet or $1,200 per square foot. I'm so sorry. Um, so those are the types of you know, quick uh, numbers that you could apply um, these. So uh, you know, I think given the what sixteen five to seventeen thousand nine hundred, you know, <laughs> you could probably start to think somewhere in the twenty sort of million dollar plus or minus. I think the key is, uh, and that next phase is not only to engage a community, but to come up with scenarios that talk about what the budget and the cost of these would be and identify some potential funding sources and what we as a community can do, whether that's um, a general obligation bond, uh, some grants, there's a number of different ways that these facilities can be built. And part of that phase two would be to develop a budget for those scenarios and come up with some paths forward for the city to consider uh, ways to sort of fund the project and move that forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of money. So, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hate yeah. to scare people. I'm so sorry. No, no, I appreciate it because you, you have identified a very real need that we have. Um, I think, as Vice Mayor Brooks mentioned, it's kind of a, a grayed out area right now in, in that we see it as a priority in the future as it was 10 years ago and 10 years before that. Um, but $20 million is a lot of money at a time when we're trying to complete a wharf. And just in the last, what, four or five years, we finished a $12, $12 million library and lots of big projects. And so um, I do look forward to hearing um, more about this in the budget discussions, but I, I personally also think that this is probably a longer term project um, than we should be prepared to start budgeting for this year. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, what might be helpful though to, or what I'd like to see, even if it's in a Friday update, is just, I know we're looking at potential ballot measures for November, but just trying to understand what bonds look like for, for the city in the future and really what that means. And if we were to borrow or $20 million to complete a project like this, I think those are just like things we can get answered to today to see really how far off we are. And I know with rate or um, what are those called interest rates and will change in five years or whatever, but maybe that'll just kind of give us a, some, some ideas of, about how really far out this is. Thank you, sorry. If I'd like to add one more thing. Um, I was working with the sheriff's office when they were rebuilding the new sheriff's office and they thought they would never be able to get to their over $100 million point. And, uh, and there was a lot of planning that went into that. Um, I would like to see us continue the planning and, uh, and, and then we can work on the funding and, and maybe we can identify a, a location. Um, but I would really love to see us keep moving forward on it. I would second that because I know... I don't think this is what anybody's saying, but even though it seems like an incredibly daunting task and you know, an unfathomable number or price tag on this, I think it's still really important to keep moving these steps forward because you know if we don't take any steps forward in the next decade, then where are we going to be you know, when a disaster strikes and we're still going to be you know, that 10 years out, even if it is a very ambitious goal. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Staff, um, bring us back some more numbers and consideration in our budget, budget discussions.
Yeah. yeah, sure. Show us where we can find that twenty million. Twenty million dollars. I guess. I guess what I would share with with council and the community on this is that you know these sorts of things happen in steps, and and it's a big it's a big number. But as I mentioned before, you know we have been affected by multiple disasters. Our police station has been underwater. That means we'll have certain partners who are willing to help. For certain portions, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a local contribution. There absolutely would be, and we're absolutely going to have to be creative. But I think that if we can kind of break it into chunks, I think that there is the possibility. And it is, I think, all the council members are right. It's like you have to, at some point, you have to take that first step and figuring out strategically when that right time is, is absolutely essential. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to item 9B about the Jade Street Park Universally Accessible Playground Project. Welcome. Hey, good evening, Mayor and Council members. I realize after this is published that our park has a name, and I should have titled it the name of the park. So this is the Treasure Clove at Jade Street Park, bringing you back this back to you this evening to request funds to do our final uh, ps &E. So as a reminder, the uh, Treasure Code at J Street Park is a park that was constructed in the late 90s and had some revisions in the early 2000s, but it's to completely replace all the park equipment and replace it with a fully accessible playground. We've partnered with both um, the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks for fundraising on this project, and we are under contract with Rody Design, who is a very well-known uh, parks designer in the uh, Northern California. So a quick timeline to, uh, to jog your memories is that we got that uh, agreement with Verdi to start our community outreach, which we had a survey and several outreach meetings to develop a design of this park and have an existing MOU now with the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks to raise a million dollars for the project. Um, brought a conceptual plan and a final conceptual plan to you all in the summer of 2023 and have not been back since. Uh, so we are in April 2024, and if you are on the Friends newsletter, they've achieved 50% of their fundraising goal, which is really exciting. They have a lot of traction. They still have a lot of interest, both on the park in general and then also on individ sponsoring individual parts of the park. So they are very excited. Um, so with that, we are looking to get started on the final plan specifications and estimates so we have a bid-ready project. Uh, between now and construction, which we would hope to start in the spring of next year, we have to complete our plans, but then also identify some additional funding. So next slide. So part of getting the ps &E and the final plans is to have a shovel-ready project. And shovel-ready projects are ones that you can go out and bid the next day. Um, and that's a lot of times what you need for external funding. Um, so as you know, we have our funding from the CDBG via HUD federal funding for the community center to start later this fall. Um, that was very much a uh, shot in the dark that we achieved and we're hoping to strike lightning twice in the same spot. Uh, there's another round of funding coming up this summer. And then the rumor also is that state parks is gonna have another round of general statewide funding for parks uh, later this year also. So really having final bid ready plans puts us in a really good position to obtain some additional funding. Next slide. Um, so just if you're not aware, what we have now is a conceptual plan. There are very nice pictures and a rough, more than a rough, but a, very much a cost estimate. And what we're trying to get there is what's on the right, which is very pretty to me, um, our uh, bid ready plans, engineered specs, that kind of thing. Next slide. Um, also included in the uh, scope for this uh, Verde update is the path of travel from the playground to the restroom. That was not in their original scope. It is not currently ADA, it's a DG. So it would be getting them to design it to the appropriate grade and then also appropriate materials to get from the park area to the restroom. Also potentially part of some of that grant funding would be to apply to update the restroom because while it is ADA, it is definitely not in the most ideal configuration for today's standards and expectations. Next slide. Um, so as a reminder, the fiscal impact here, we have um, with the fundraising goal when the friends meet, meet it about $1.3 million. We have a conceptual plan of about 1.7 and then that enhanced design, if we come up with other funds, uh, additional play equipment, upgraded play equipment that we identified to be in the same footprint, so easily implementable and pivotable. Um, we still would have a shortfall of around three to $5 million, which hopefully we can alleviate with those grants or additional fundraising. 
I would hope by the end of this calendar year, we would have some direction on if we got these grants or not and be able to make a more informed decision. Jessica, I think you said three to five million, but oh, you I meant- did. Different project. Yeah. <laughs> 300 to $500,000, thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, and so with that, here are some pretty pictures <laughs> and the recommended action, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? No questions? Questions? Yes, go ahead. Just have a question on the uh, path to the bathroom. You said it's decomposed granite right now. Yes. And that's not good for wheelchairs, is that? Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, with that, we'll bring it out to public comment. If there's any public comment on this item, now would be the time. Welcome back. Shortfall of three to five million dollars. Is that what I heard? <laughs> that was three three that was a, a misspeak. Sorry. It was three three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Okay. A lot of money. Um the elephant in the room. <laughs> I go to Jade Street Park sometimes. And I used to take classes in the community center years ago. And I was in this very room some years back when uh, Verizon uh, put a cell tower. They got approval initially and then to put a cell tower on top of um, near 41st Avenue, New Leaf. And it's like a telecommunication. Corporations, dictatorship. The city council had an ordinance that said there needed to be a certain distance between cell sites and neighborhoods. And Verizon didn't like that. It was too restrictive. The city council, with Mike Termini leading the comments, said, we do not like to be told what to do. We as city council members feel that we need to make decisions that we feel are in the best interests of those we represent. And the city council upheld that ordinance to not have that cell site there. What happened was, Verizon said, you have to change your ordinance because you're restricting our industry. Ms. Garrett, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want okay, to remind you, this so is where, on the Universal uh, that's Playground. Point where there is right now on top of the community building at Jade Street Park, do you know this? An antenna emitting microwave radiation, which is biologically harmful, especially to children. That should not be there. Children and everyone should have a right to not be microwaved and harmed. So when you're talking about universally acceptable, you're just not talking about this, but it is a key factor. I and many others avoid certain places where we feel terrible from the microwaves, headaches, et cetera. There are a lot of symptoms and um, that needs to be made accessible to everyone by removing the microwave radiation harm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Any further public comment on this item? All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council and uh, I'll start with comments on this end. Councilmember Peterson, any comments? No? Ms. Mayor Brooks? Comments? No? All right, well then we'll entertain a motion. Just one, one quick comment. Okay. Uh, I would just like to shout out to our friends with County Parks. They've been doing a great job on finding our uh, fundraising mm -hmm. throughout the county and so my hat's off to them. Yeah, I, I will echo that. Our friends at County Park Friends have been all over the place, um, along with um, Dan Hayfley and, and uh, Mariah and Tricia. Everywhere I go, it seems like there's one of those three are given a presentation on this park and to reminding everyone how important it is and to donate. 
Um, this Sunday, my mayor's message in the Sentinel, as well as uh, next week in the uh, Capitola Times, will include more information about this project and the community center uh, renovations and upgrades. Uh, this has been um, a really great opportunity for us to collaborate with County Park Friends. I appreciate the time that staff has put into this, the uh, Verde design for the wonderful design they've created for us, and uh, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks for really having the vision for this a playground. I'm really excited to see uh, this move forward. Um, if there's no further discussion, we can entertain a motion. I think we are looking for authorization uh, for amendment one to a professional services agreement with Verde Design in the amount of $107.30 for final plan specifications and estimates. I can't make a motion. I'll move to approve the recommended action. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, so I will turn to my city attorney to ensure that I'm doing this correctly because we are going into closed session. So I can adjourn our open session and reconvene a closed session, assuming we're not going to convene again if we have no reportable action. Uh, Madam Mayor, if we could reconvene so I can report out on that. Oh, we will have to reconvene. Okay. Yes. So for now, we will adjourn our open session meeting and convene our closed session meeting. And uh, we will recess to the closed session and <laughs> reconvene after the closed session. For those of you who won't be staying for that, uh, have a good night. Please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Do we need to wait for Julia or Chloe, or we, we're live? We have to report, but we don't have to Zoom it, I don't think, legally, do we? I think we're live. It says YouTube right there. It is live, okay. That's okay, I don't think we need her. No offense. I mean, we always need her, but we'll be okay right now. All right, uh, we are going to reconvene from our closed session. Can we get a report out on closed session? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss item number three on this evening's closed session agenda. Um, direction was given, no final action was taken. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, we will uh, adjourn, and everyone take care of yourselves. Have a good night. <laughs>